All right, I'm going to start the presentation, and when tables are called, don't feel like you're interrupting the presentation at all, because since it's storming, I'm not going to stretch this out. We're just going to we're just going to go. So as your table's called and they call you, feel free to get up. It won't bother me, and I don't think it'll bother anybody else. I'm here for you. You're not here for me. Okay. Now, what I'd also like to ask before I start the presentation, I have this much material plus the slides. Not that I want to go over tonight. I am going over tonight. So I'm going to run through this, and I'm going to run through it fast. The reason I'm doing this is I'm going to hit topic by topic by topic by topic. Every topic I want you to be aware of, become aware of. So I'm not trying to help you understand all the components and capacities of every single strategy I'm going to share with you, as much as to illustrate that there are all these strategies and opportunities. And then at the end, I'll give you all an opportunity. I have held the next couple weeks open for appointments. We'll be able to get together one on one, and you can evaluate with me personally in your own circumstances to dig deeper on any of these areas or strategies you want to find out more about and how it impacts you personally. And we'll be able to take a lot of time and dig deeper then on your own situations. So, what I'd ask as a favor is if you could write down your questions. As I go through the presentation so I don't get interrupted and save them either for the end or for our appointment so I can get through all of this and get everyone out at a pretty reasonable time. Would that be okay with everyone? Okay. All right. Let's run with this then. The first thing I want to do is basically just help you understand Oh, I have to push it back on. I have a tech department. <laughs> but I think I've got it. Power button. You know, I have to explain I have to share something before I start. Some things I know a great amount about, and other things, not so much. <laughs> so just this week, I share this with you, we had a garbage disposal that was not working. So I call a plumber, and the plumber comes out, and I'm paying for this plumber, of course. The plumber comes out, looks at the garbage disposal, said, did you put the key in, you, most of you know this, probably all of you know this, did you put the key in the bottom and turn it? I said, key? <laughs> so he puts the key in the bottom, turns it, everything works fine, and he goes away. That's number one. Number two, the air conditioning at the office wouldn't turn on yesterday. Who do I call? Air conditioning guy. So he comes out today. I'm paying him too, right? Air conditioner guy comes out today, comes out and he says, circuit breaker button was off. <laughs> Here I am, I don't even know to turn the power button on this. So you have to give me some leeway. Right <laughs> you have to be gentle with me. All right, here's what we're going to do. Tonight, I'm going to cover the 2015, the year 2015 outlook. What I see and what the economists see and what the money managers see, and I'm going to share some of that with you. The key here is to watch in 2015, the strategies to consider, especially in your own circumstances, and then questions and answers again at the end time. Now, there are five key areas of financial planning. If I did not do any more slides, the whole night. This is the key slide of everything that we do. We deal with the key areas of financial planning, which are protection, retirement plan, investments, tax planning, and estate planning. 
I'm going to cover all of this area tonight. The first area, which all of you are curious with, is how was 2014? Was it a good year or a bad year in the market? How many think 2014 was a good year in the market? How many think 2014 was a bad year in the market? I think we'd all agree, though, 2014 was a very, very volatile year in the market. It was volatile. So what we're looking at, the 2014 market return, and here they are. These are the actual market returns from 2014, which with each of the in, in averages. You look at the Dow was up 7.52%, S&P 500 was up over 11%. So it was a very good year for people holding in the markets. But I also put together for you tonight, within the last couple of days, or maybe a little last week, news that I pulled out of newspapers and off the internet sites to share with you to add to some of these issues. The one I have here was from CBS Market Watch. Are you over, and these are different articles I came across that I wanted to share with you. One of them is, are you overlooking big threats to your finances? So when I go back to the slide right before they say financial planning, we look at the market returns and the market volatility as the big risk to our finances. But I'm here to share with you, and so is this article, the big risks to your finances aren't anything what you think. This article goes on to say, while investors are focusing on these relatively modest drags on their annual investment return, they may be overlooking big gaps in their financial plans that could quickly destroy the savings they have accumulated. Mistakes such as failing to buy life health and disability insurance, holding a badly diversified investment portfolio, or betting big on stocks when you don't really have the stomach or the time frame for it. So there are huge risks outside of financial markets. Long-term care insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, even lawsuit insurance. Does anyone know what lawsuit insurance is? It's car insurance, it's home insurance, and it's umbrella liability. So we look at this and it says, if I go on, it's hard to know precisely how many families are underinsured or making overly large investment bets. But the available statistics suggest the problem is widespread. I'm going to tell you it is widespread from my experience. For instance, according to the Social Security Administration, 68% of the private sector workers don't have long-term disability insurance. It's almost two-thirds. It is two-thirds. They don't have it. People misjudge the risk. People think it won't happen to them, and they're big mistakes. So this article, the author's advice is this. My advice, spend some time thinking about life's nightmare scenarios. You know, hardly anybody's ever verbalized that. That's outstanding advice. Sit and think, what could hurt me most? Write it down. And that's the key, first step, to proper financial planning. Identifying what can hurt you most. Don't worry about how we find solutions. There are solutions. Figure out what can hurt you most. And that's the key, I think, step to financial planning. Now, as I said, 2014 market returns. But look at the bottom. Bodan, your question to me was, what do we do with safe alternatives? Look at the bottom. We don't have any good interest rates for safe alternatives. And the market, is it well priced, reasonably priced, high priced, or low priced? We look at this, the market's definitely trading at above average valuation. But, they're not enormously overvalued. That spike was in 2010. But the actual average right now, based on the price-earnings ratio, is 
price earnings ratio. It's not exorbitantly high. We like to see 15. So 18 is a little high, but we don't see it as exorbitantly high. But on the 2015 outlook, we do see increased volatility. We've seen a lot of it. The first 14 trading days of 2015, first 14 trading days, the Dow fell or jumped either way, but the swing was by triple digit amounts on any occasion. And it's way more than that already now that we're into it. We've seen huge volatility. So what can we do? 2015 outlook, many of the analysts, they feel the markets will rise. So if I asked everyone in the room, do you think by the end of this year, markets will be higher or lower? The professionals are saying they believe it will be higher in spite of the volatility. The Federal Reserve, what are we watching for in 2015? Federal Reserve and interest rate uncertainty could and will bring more volatility. It should and it will. We already saw it with the talk of the Fed, whether they're going to increase interest rates or not. Oil prices could create market disruptions. It already did. Since these slides were printed, it already did. International concerns need to be monitored. And I'll share some of that with you throughout this presentation. But you'll see international connects with us much closer than you thought maybe even five years ago. And the US political landscape has changed. And we'll get into that. So I'll get into each one of these points. The S&P 500 estimates, all these analysts are saying over 2100. All that means is the S&P 500 is right now very close to 2100. All these analysts on the chart are saying it's going to be higher by the end of the year. These are the estimates. Now, the next factor is this. I have a couple other brand new articles. One dated April 9th. That's today. Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan. Anyone familiar with him? Okay, he's the top dog in J.P. Morgan. And he says in his annual letter to shareholders, he warned there will be another crisis and the market reaction could even be more volatile because regulations, and he's in the banking industry, are now tough. He said, those regulations hamper the bank's capacity to add as a buffer against shocks in financial markets like they did in 2008. So he sees problems and he said recent activity in the treasury markets and the currency markets is a warning shot across the bottom. Now that's his take on this. So the next article I look at is, again on market watch, the caption is should you follow Mohammed Al Arian, who is the ex really chief at PIMCO, no longer, and move your investments to cash. So he was asked in a recent interview that he just had, where is your money? Stocks, treasuries, or bonds, or where? And his answer was, it's mostly concentrated right now in cash. That's scary. So the next article I look at, the day before, April 8th, Warren Buffett. And it says, when it comes to stocks versus cash, and again, market watch, because I kept it all the same source, follow Buffett's lead. Everybody knows Warren Buffett, right? Those of Warren Buffett. And here's what, Warren, here's what the trick question in this article. See if you can figure it out. Of the following two investments, which one carries the highest risk? Cash or stocks? This was asked of Warren Buffett. Of the two investments, now I want to raise of hands, which one is the more highest risk, cash or stocks? Who thinks cash? Who thinks stocks? Okay. The article goes on to say, you might be tempted to say these days, stocks, of course. But the answer, by Warren Buffett's term, is cash is higher risk, hands down. None of us think of it. But he goes on to say, the billionaire investor Warren Buffett addressed the concept in his most recent letter to shareholders of his company, which is Berkshire Hathaway. 
and he produces an annual report. And he wrote in his annual report, many retirement investors tend to think that cash is safe and that stocks are risky. But he goes on to say it really should be the other way around. Stocks have a long running record of handily outperforming the major investment choices, including gold and bonds. But it's cash that is the absolute loser thanks to inflation, a relentless force that destroys purchasing power like rust gnawing away at an unpainted bridge, he said. So he goes on to say, as Buffett explains, during the past five decades, which is 50 years, from 1964 through 2014, the S&P 500 index returned 11.196 percent, including reinvested div dividends annually. During those years, the value of the dollar fell by 87 percent. So the S&P 500 average increased 11, over 11 percent annually, this is and the money in cash depleted itself in value by 87 percent over that same period in time. If you owned U.S. bonds during those years, yes, you earned a quote unquote safe rate of return, but you ultimately lost 87% of the purchasing power of those invested dollars. And that is what Warren Buffett said and wrote in his annual report to his investors. And I wanted to share that with you. The problem, Buffett says, is that people equate volatility, the daily movement of stock prices up and down, with risk. So there are different forms of risk. And I wanted to share those articles with you because they're right now. They are right now. Now, when we get into these different percentages with higher interest rates, we're looking at the Fed. And what we're looking to try to see is what's going to happen with the federal funds rate. So for your question on where do we go for safe money, it tracks the federal funds rate. And no CDs or fixed annuities or anything will be much higher than these federal funds rates. So we're watching federal funds rates and Janet Yellen and see what the Federal Reserve does because we want interest rates to go up. But when we're buying a house, we like interest rates to stay down. So we have a force against each other Buyers versus investors. Most of you in this room are buyers and investors. We buy things, we finance cars, we finance homes, and we invest money. So we kind of want both. We can't have it, but that's what we want. So for those of us for our savings, we're seeing very low alternatives to almost 0%, and that's because of these federal fund rates. So we're watching for the Fed to see if and how quickly they're going to raise rates. Anyone who has bonds knows this lesson. If you buy a bond and interest rates go up, the bond price and value has a potential to go down. The reason I say potential to go down is if you hold it to maturity, you're avoiding some of that market risk of a bond going down. But the general rule is bonds prices if you spend $10,000 for a bond and you're at a fixed interest rate and Janet Yellen does raise the interest rates, your bond's going to be worth less if you have to sell it between now and mature. That's the way it works. It's all a function of future value and timeline and I won't get into that, but that's how they work. But I will share this and I shared this in my last workshop also. Do not fear the Fed, like you see in the reports. You know, I pulled this article, and I pulled a lot of them. Key passages from the Fed's minutes. This is Janet Yellen, and the minutes from the Federal Reserve meeting. And here's what it is. The Federal Open Market Committee minutes. Here's how they read, and now you'll understand after I read this, why we don't have any clue what and when they're going to do anything. Here's why. These are from the actual minutes on when to hike interest rates, which is what we're all interested in. Quote, several participants judged that the economic data and outlook 
were likely to warrant beginning normalization at the June meeting. That means raising interest rates. However, others anticipated that the effects of energy price declines and the dollar's appreciation would continue to weigh on inflation in the near term, suggesting that conditions likely would not be appropriate to begin raising rates until later in the year. And a couple of participants suggested that the economic outlook likely would not call for liftoff until 2016. Now you can see why we have no clue whether or when the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates. But I think we can be fairly confident we know they will. We just don't know when, and we just don't know how much, and we don't know what impact it will have on our investment or the market. Depends on how gently I think that they raise them. We do have some problems here. One of them is the jobs report, which came out right after that meeting. So the next article says, the minutes of the March 17th to 18th meeting might not reflect the current thinking of U.S. central bank officials in light of the weak March job data released two weeks late, which was two weeks after. So you can see how rapidly things change. But that's why I put this chart up on the, on the screen. This is an indication of every time the Federal Reserve raised rates, the green is showing what happened to the markets. The red is showing what happened to the markets. You can see in almost every time frame of the time span that the Federal Reserve went through in a rate increasing environment, only two of all of these time periods did the markets suffer as a result of the rates going up. So I think there's a lot being made about this, but I think the Federal Reserve is so aware painfully aware almost of the punishing effect raising interest rates could have, I think they'll be trying to be very general about this when they do it, and they will do it. Now the next area that we see, we see oil. So the next area that we have to concern ourselves with is, does this affect our investments? We know oil, the price of oil, affects transportation, it affects shipping, and in our area and now all across the world, it affects jobs. We are seeing a drop off and a decline on jobs already because natural gas has dropped, but we also saw the markets get rattled because of these fast and somewhat unexpected drop in oil prices. So we have to keep tabs on this oil. But what we also see on the oil prices are, you saw the news today, Royal Dutch, uh, yesterday actually, Royal Dutch Shell agreed to take over BG Group. These are oil companies beginning mergers because the price is low enough to take advantage of consolidation and mergers in the industry. So we will see, we saw this in the financial industry after the collapse in 08, many mergers and acquisitions. Those of you who have companies, stocks in companies, mutual funds, annuities, You've seen name changes, lots of them. That's mergers, acquisitions. They are buying and selling each other out when prices get lower due to the financial collapse and now due to the natural gas prices and oil coming down, companies are cheap. So they're buying each other, taking advantage of the lower price. So we're seeing a lot here and it all affects our finances. Now internationally, we have issues with the European economy. I'm here to share with you, we have to be careful with what's going on overseas and how it affects our investments here. One of them is this. This date, uh, it's again April 9th. I pulled the most current articles I could. So this is today's Wall Street Journal. New era in bonds. Zero yield or less. Now this is international. And it goes on to say, until Wednesday, no country had ever sold 10-year debt that gives investors a yield of below 0%. But guess what they just did? It goes on to say, to extraordinary milestones, Switzerland, on Wednesday, sold 10-year bonds that investors are actually paying to hold. In other words, they're getting less than 0%. So they're getting less than 100% of their money back. 
That's what that means. And guess what? Mexico lined up a rare transaction that says to borrow euros, it promised to repay 100 years from now. At a yield of 4.2%. So we're watching the world closely. This is current news, folks. Last week we didn't have that. This is current today news. And it affects our investments, it affects our portfolio. Another article, April 7th. Greece's cash crunch is getting serious. Do you think? <laughs> it goes on to say the European Central Bank. Greece seems unlikely to default this week. But no resolution to its financial stability beyond next week is in sight said Carl Weinberg, chief global economist at High Frequency Economics. That's scary. Will they depart from the European Union and the Euro? We don't know yet. There's talk about that. So does it affect our finances? It absolutely does. When we get into the US, I don't know, maybe it gets worse. I put out a report. Every one of you on my email list gets this report every Monday. This is my market commentary. This week's commentary went into your heads into deflation, the Swiss take preemptive action, which is what I just went into here, central banks' currency issues, interest rates fall lower and lower, healthcare revolution, really. I go into all of this in my reports. Every week you can get a copy of this. Monday in your email box. That's why I put these out to keep you current. So make sure you get on our email list. You'll get those every Monday. Now another article I ran into, which is somewhat disturbing in a different area that can be very big in our finances. This article by Bob Fredericks, White House. You know this already. You've probably read it already in the news. The White House computers were hacked by Russians. Did anyone see that yet? Okay, so you know I'm not making this up. I couldn't even make this up. Thank you. Russian hackers penetrated a White House computer system and were able to eyeball sensitive information, including details of President Obama's schedule that were supposed to be secret. A new report said this Tuesday, the hackers were believed to be the same ones who cracked into computers at the State Department in recent months, CNN reported. Scary business. I don't know. The House and Senate, there have been political changes in the U.S. The House and Senate now, what effect will it have, or impact will it have, if both the House and Senate are controlled by Republicans? We're starting to see possibly a little more bipartisanship, we'll see. We're, we're seeing and hearing talk about it. We will see if it happens. But the potential tax law changes that are being proposed and have already been proposed, to me, a little disturbing. We are starting to see issues that affect our assets and our investments and our future and our future generations. I'm talking about estate taxes, income taxes, but we'll get into that now. So the tax side of plan for retirement planning is huge. Now, the issue is, first, capital gains. Everyone's familiar with capital gains. Capital gains tax rate, what's the lowest capital gains tax rate right now? This may sound like a trick question. Who says the lowest capital gains rate right now is 28%? Who says the lowest capital gains rate, rate right now is 20%? Who says the lowest capital gains rate right now is 15%? Who says the lowest capital gains tax rate right now is 0%? There isn't it. Hold your hands up. Very good. The lowest capital gains tax rate right now in the tax code is 0 I say this workshop after workshop after workshop. 
Those of you that are here that are here that have been here at the workshop know that. But you're not taking advantage of it, some of you. We have a 0% capital gains tax rate if your ordinary income tax rate is 15%. What does that mean? Number one, we're going to lose it. I know we're going to lose it. I just don't know when. You know from three and four years ago from my workshops, I thought we were going to lose it in 2010. We got saved. It's still in the tax law. What do you do? Any, you look at all your investment holdings that are non-qualified, not in IRAs, there will be taxable gains. You can see that by your statements. It'll say unrealized gains. And you look at your statements and you say, my unrealized gains, you don't have to have said that with your unrealized losses. You can sell only your gain positions. If you sell your gain positions and you're in a 0% tax bracket for capital gains, you can rebuy back the same security. Guess how long you have to wait to rebuy the same security that you sold for a capital gain? How long do you have to wait before you can rebuy that same security? What is it? An hour. An hour. And not even that long. So we have a rule, and I don't want to confuse you. If you sell at a loss to pin that loss, you cannot rebuy that same security right away. You must wait in excess of 30 days. We use a 31-day rule. You cannot rebuy that same security and deduct that loss on your tax returns and all the IRS has not like that. It's tax loss harvesting. We do it all the time. But we cannot rebuy the same security immediately. But there's no rule against selling securities for gains. So take advantage of the zero capital gains tax credit. Set an appointment with me, we'll look at all your holdings, we'll figure out tax efficiency inside your holdings. Why would I sell a gain? It's the best holding you have. Why would I dump it? Because I want, because your basis, you might have bought it for $10 and it's $100. It's a $90 gain. If there's zero tax, we'll take the $100, we'll reinvest the 100 now I have a $100 cost basis. We'll only pay the tax on anything that exceeds the $100 in the future. You get that. So that's the only reason we do it. We'll rebuy the same security. You won't be out of the market for more than even an hour. So it's a strategy that we can use, but everyone in the room should not be. Everyone is different. And every strategy I bring up has a different consequence somewhere else. We cannot apply these consequences simply by coming to a workshop and then go home and apply them because you'll make mistakes. It could affect other areas in your life. For instance, it could push you. You have to watch your tax credit. I don't want to take any tax credit away. I don't want to force your Social Security to be taxed any higher. There are a lot of ramifications we have to look at. It's not as simple as it sounds. You have qualified dividend income. Most people are unaware of that, but that can also be at zero percent. So when you've got your 1099s this year on your mutual funds, you'll see qualified dividend income, qualify, and then you'll see the long-term and short-term capital gains. You didn't know what qualified dividend income was sometimes, but that could also be at a zero or reduced rate just like the capital gains. All right, enough of that, but all tax laws require careful evaluation. We have a 3.8 percent Medicare tax on your investment earnings, if you earn too much money, things like that. We have to be very careful because I say we have a 15% capital gains tax rate. It's a 20% capital gains tax rate if you make too much money. And if you really make too much money, they tack on a 3.8% Medicare tax in addition, or also the alternative minimum tax. So it could be higher than the 20% capital gains, or even the 238 because of the alternative minimum tax. There's a lot of work to go into this, but this tax planning, we can make your programs much more tax efficient. Now, I have another area for you that I'm keeping tabs on, and that's what we do. 529 plans, they're tax efficient ways. Remember we talked about estate planning. You can gift money to kids or anyone you want. How much is the maximum? $14,000 a year. But it's not really the maximum. You can gift the 529 plans. 
it counts against the 14,000, that's true, but you can gift without being taxable $300,000, $500,000, it doesn't matter if your total net worth is less than $5.43 million per spouse. Because what we have to do is we have to file a gift tax return on everything over $14,000. That doesn't mean we owe the tax. So think about these 529 plans because you can gift to those. And here's something else you can do in excess over the $14,000. Doesn't even count against the $14,000. If you pay medical payments and educational payments to anyone, let's say a child or a grandchild or anyone like that, it won't work. But if you pay it directly to the institution, the medical care provider, the hospital, on behalf of any, any other person, you're gifting and paying their bills unlimited. So if you wanted to gift someone for their educational expenses, pay it directly to the college on their behalf, you still have your $14,000 freed up for gifting. It helps for a state plan. We find this a lot in life insurance. We will find people create life insurance and they'll pay $14,000 a year, not for the child. They'll buy life insurance with a premium of $14,000 a year. That life insurance policy might be five or $600,000 they're gifting. There are huge advantages to take care of, take advantage of the annual gifting exclusions, and you can leverage them to the maximum by how you do the gift and to whom you actually provide. All right, next, estate taxes. We already know we can avoid a lot of problems with estate taxes. When we go through charts like this, we've got the who, what, where, and why. But estate taxes, most everybody in the room needs to be more concerned about capital gain. And the step up in basis. Then you do the federal estate tax. You want me to go over what that means? There's a totally different strategy now than there was. The strategy before was shrink your estates down to stay under the $1 million limit so you don't owe federal estate tax, which was as high as the government robbing your heirs of 55% of the total value of your estate. Now, you can have $5.43 million for each spouse. That's almost $11 million before there's any federal estate tax. That is no longer our major concern. <coughs> now our major concern is, how can we get all of our assets to our kids and not lose them to a nursing home and make sure we don't owe capital gains tax? Capital gains tax. All in one year, we dump assets onto the kids. We might have them in the highest capital gains tax rate. That's a problem. So what we do is we figure out assets when you're in retirement, which assets do you draw from? And which assets don't you draw from? So that we leave the assets that are most tax favored for the heirs for them when they are actually inheriting money. That's how we do it. Now, what about Social Security? What about income? What about all your sources of income? When we're in retirement, we have to evaluate income. One of the biggest problems I see when we're in retirement income planning, we forget to protect the spouse for loss of Social Security on the death of one of the two participants. We carry life insurance the whole way up until our kids are out of college and our homes are paid off and we think we don't need it anymore. And then I run into retirement planning, and I say, wait a minute. Sometimes there are second mortgages on the houses. Sometimes there are student loans. Sometimes we have a spouse that both of our social securities and pensions are dependent on both of us living. And if one of us dies, the spouse only gets to keep the larger of the two checks and loses the smaller one. So if I have $2,500 on the one spouse a month, and the other spouse has, let's say, $2,000, one of those spouses dies, that family lost $2,000 a month. So I'm back in the same boat as when they both worked in their 40s. 
I need life insurance to replace that income. I also need life insurance if I want to do advanced estate planning. I might want to establish a foundation if I was you. And you might have someone that you know died of cancer, had leukemia, has Alzheimer's, something, and you would, a church, and you want to provide a legacy or a remembrance, or you want to pr promote the, the help to the fund, and you don't have the assets, you need them. So some people will actually create a foundation, either while they're living and they'll carve out assets, or after they're deceased and they'll carve out assets. And the foundation will go on long after them, serving a good and wholesome purpose. Or they'll simply buy life insurance because it costs less. And upon death, that is dedicated to establishing a foundation, a trust, and it gets to the purpose that you really wanted it to go to. So there are many, many ways to do estate planning, not just the obvious. The other thing is with Social Security, there are strategies on when to take Social Security, whether to take Social Security, file and suspend, all these different strategies. If you just wait until you get to age 62 and take it, or wait until you're 67 and take it, you're probably making a mistake doing the obvious. You want to get together, you want to sit down, we'll sit down with you and do the math and the calculations to see the optimal methods and when and timing of taking Social Security so that you both maximize the most amount of benefits you can get from the Social Security system and when to take it. And it's very important uh, that we use it as rapidly as we can and we know the strategies because Right now, again, in current news, the Democrats rethink the Social Security strategy. You know, we want our money, but they want our money too. So we have to know the rules. We want to work very hard to know the rules. When we look at this, all sources of the income that you look at, especially in retirement, you're looking at many different sources. And you do have control over how and where you take your income. You do have control more than you think. There are a lot of advantages to planning in advance of retirement and for and during retirement. One of them is, which I'll get to on the next slide, IRAs. We think we're trapped in our IRAs. I heard in the 80s and the 90s from so many clients, why did our advisors ever put us in a traditional IRA? That was the worst thing we ever could have been in. And the reason they say that is, all our money now that we need in retirement is taxable. Every single dime is taxable. We can't have our own money. I got complaints over, complaints over, complaints over that. It's trapped in there. And then at 70 and a half, we're forced to take income from the IRA if we don't want to. So that causes a tax consequence, a tax problem. It raises our, potentially raises our tax bracket, potentially costs Social Security being taxed, and has a number of other problems, including depleting our estate that we wanted to leave to the air. Now, many of you know with an IRA, we have special strategies. But I'm going to share with you before I leave this, this slide, one major flaw in almost every plan I see. And it's up there on the board, but I'll bet none of you can guess which one it is. Anyone want to take a guess? Somebody will get it right if you guess it, huh? <laughs> it's beneficiary planning. That's exactly what it is. If I look at portfolios, 401ks, pensions, everything, I almost never see things match. That can't be right. It's because when we first got our pension, we had forms filled out, we only had one kid then. Now we have three or we didn't have the grandkids, or whatever, or it's a second marriage, or whatever. And we're seeing that over and over and over again. The life insurance doesn't match the annuities, doesn't match the pensions, doesn't match the IRA, doesn't match the 401 case. So beneficiary planning, write down on your forms when we get together. That is priority one. It will mess up a lot of plans. Some people even have a spouse still listed, and the spouse is deceased, and we don't have a contingent plan. Now, the new IRA rollover. Anyone know what it is? The newest one. There are two. Yes. Yes. One IRA rollover. This is the dumbest rule I've seen yet. Right? 
One IRA rule. I tell you where you can go and trust the information. Anytime you go to get information, you go to the horse's mouth, right? You go to the source. So the source is the IRS. So we've always gone to the source, and the source is publication 590. We've always gone to the IRS and followed them to a T. We're scared to death of the IRS, right? So we follow them to the T. And the 590 always said, as many rollovers as you want, as long as it's within 60 days, you put it back. In fact, the technical rule says you put it back into yet a different IRA, not back into the same one. That's how the rule reads. Just last year, boom, lawsuit, IRS wins. Guess what the conditions of the lawsuit were? Somebody did more than one rollover. Therefore, the second one, within one year, second one was taxable, and they won in direct contradiction to their own publication. We did. So they revised the rules, and we're all scampering around, you know, saying, what? So we've had to change that. So here's the deal. What is a rollover? A rollover is when you take the money out. What is a trustee to trustee transfer? Trusted and trusted transfers, when you sign a paper to one IRA or 401k, please send the money over somewhere else. I'm not taking the money out. That's a trusted and trusted transfer. You can do as many of them as you want. But not the rule. Anyone heard of the qualified longevity annuity contract? You can put in an IRA where you have to withdraw at 70 and a half. You can put a condition in there, and by the way, in vehicles inside there, this qualified longevity annuity, and not take 25% of your IRA as a required minimum distribution as late as until you're age 85. <coughs> How many of you know that? Well, it's there. It's a new law. As of July 2014, actually. That's not so new. Now, how about a Roth? We've got all kinds of things we can do with these IRAs. So remember when I said income planning, tax planning, tax efficiency, estate planning, when we need income, where do we take the assets? Strategically, do we take them from our IRA? Do we take them from our capital gains? Do we take them from our dividend interest? See what I mean? Do we take them from our annuities? We have to do strategical planning to make sure we're tax efficient. Uh, rollovers to Roth IRAs. We know all about that by now, right? A rollover to a Roth IRA. I have a, an investment account, $100,000. I roll it over to a Roth IRA conversion, is what it's called, and I pay ordinary income tax for that tax year on that conversion in full, if that's how I did it. And if that's the case, I cause that whole 100%, $100,000 IRA to be taxable in this tax year. Why did I do that? Because after 30% is lost in taxes, I still have $70,000 that's converted now to a Roth IRA, which will be forever tax-free. Okay, I don't know whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the plan on a Roth conversion. What if I still have the same holdings, I rebuy the same portfolio, 100,000, I had 70,000, I add 30 more to it, I have 100,000 and I reinvested in the same portfolio I have 100,000 and the market's crashed and it goes down to 40,000. I just paid tax on $100,000. And that Roth account's worth 40. Do you think that might not have worked out so well? <laughs> I mean, for 40 to grow back tax free to 100, that's going to take a long time. But are any of you aware of a recharacterization? I know a couple of you are, but most of you aren't. Recharacterization means you get a do-over. By October 15th of the following year, if you still don't like it, you can recharacterize it back to a traditional IRA. Your account's only worth 40, but if you recharacterize it, you get the whole thing back and get all your taxes back. And then you do it over again. So I know some investors that purposely, every single year, convert to a Roth knowing a year and a half from now, if that Roth account booms, they're going to keep it. And if it drops, they're going to recharacterize it. Every single year. They do it. I'm not kidding. They do it. So there are individual strategies with that. Some people say, well, wait a minute. Why don't I, if I have 10 different holdings, do 10 different conversions? Because maybe I only want to recharacterize three. 
I say, now you're catching them. <laughs> now you're catching them. You can use a Roth to transfer your wealth. You can use a Roth and put it into a trust. A lot of people don't know that, but a Roth is tax-free. So we don't like our IRAs going into trusts because the tax rate on trusts is compressed, so it forces them to be taxed even at a higher rate than the IRA, typical, than traditional IRA might have. But the Roth is tax-free. So we have different benefits with that. I, I won't get into that in too much detail, but there are huge advantages with that. When we do estate planning, there are so many different areas that we get into. We have to sit down to really go through them. But the major advantage we see with estate planning is some of what I mentioned before. We have business owners who do succession planning. We go through many different scenarios with that. We're trying to create estate liquidity. We're trying to equate maybe a buy-sell agreement. We're trying to equate kids. We might have one kid working in the business, one kid not. We don't want to have to liquidate a half of the business to pay the other one. So we'll use life insurance or whatever to equate that. We'll carve out buy-sell agreements and all for any business owners. We'll do section 303 redemptions. What that is, there's actually a code in the IRS regulations for business owners that enable the estate of a business owner, you won't believe this, to remove cash from a corporation with no tax costs. I mean, there are a lot of provisions available for planning for individuals and for business owners a lot, a lot. The next thing, when we get through this, I covered the tax loss and tax gains harvesting. The Roth IRAs, inherited IRAs, are stretch IRAs. When you have an IRA, your beneficiaries have an ability now to stretch out the proceeds if they inherit that IRA and take distributions over their whole life expectancy. They don't have to pay tax all at once or over five years like we used to have to do. They're, they're old rules, but we're seeing them misapplied. Stretch IRA, you have to be a little careful on the wording, but it works. What can you do? Number one, you need to re-look at rebalancing your portfolios. Like you said, annuities or CDs, the world has changed, your portfolios should be changing with it. And I am making time available over, the, and I will discuss this at the end of the presentation, which we're close to. I am making time available for all of us to sit down and actually go through that process. Reevaluate. This is what you need to do yourselves. Reevaluate your investment goals and objectives. Confirm your investment timelines now. Are you still long term investors? Or maybe more, more towards short term investors? Reevaluate your risk tolerance. Were you aggressive and now you may be conservative? <coughs> Analyze your sources of income like we talked about. When you're in retirement especially, where is best for you to take income? Not where you're taking it from now, but reevaluate some of the sources you're not drawing from, maybe that you should be drawing from for an overall tax planning strategy. And fund your retirement accounts early. That review your emergency fund needs in retirement, guess what I'm after there? Guess what I see as emergency fund needs? You're thinking your roof and your furnace, and I'm thinking long-term care. What I'm thinking about in retirement, and what is the hardest thing for me to plan for as a financial planner in all the areas I deal with, it is the risk of long-term care. That is my hardest thing that I have to plan for. We don't know whether to do life insurance, long-term insurance, have kids help out, whether to carve out assets, go into a retirement home. How many in here know I do a radio show? Okay. On my radio show, I'm doing a whole series now. I started it in January. I figured it would take about three weeks to go through the process of the whole step, step by step in the different scenarios of how to plan for if you or a loved one might need to go into a nursing home in the future, what are all the different alternatives? I am still in the middle of that series. I cannot get done because it's so complex and I'm going through it on the, on the radio. How many of you get the videos, the video emails that I do when I, send the, when I do those broadcasts? 
Okay, not enough of you. Get on that email list that we have. Because I video those radio shows now because my son made me do that. <laughs> Sitting in the back of the room. And he said, you have to do this. And I said, oh, I don't care, okay, put a camera up. So I do, and I video them now. And he stuck them up on YouTube so you can go back in and the old ones. But I'm doing a whole series because everybody's asking me, what do we do if somebody needs into a nursing home? Everything's too expensive. Well, the truth is, they're right. Everything is too expensive. Every single alternative if someone needs to go into a nursing home. The best I can do is find the one that's least, most expensive. Because they're all too expensive. They are. And doing nothing is the most expensive one. And believe me, it is. I mean, we're using life insurance to replace assets lost. We're using long-term care insurance. We're carving out assets if we're not healthy enough to get it. We're doing Medicaid planning with attorneys. We're doing VA planning. We're, we're using every resource we can get to try to hold on to assets for spouses and children if someone needs to go into a nursing home. And we're planning in advance, hoping we never need that type of planning. So we're not really committing much assets to it that are lost if we don't go into a nursing home. That's part of the keys. What do you need to do? What else do you need to do? You've got to go through and figure out, yeah, I know what the S&P 500 did, but what did my portfolio do? It's totally different. What can you expect from us? The, the key, I think, is that I'm staying on top of as much as I can for your benefit. I come across articles upon articles for your sake. And I come across things that you think have nothing to do with finances, and in fact, they have everything to do with finances. It used to be Apple, it used to be iPhone, it used to be Facebook, it used to be Twitter, it's now 3D printing and drones and electronic stuff. So I look at these articles and I say, taste testing 3D printed food. What? <laughs> Wall Street Journal, this isn't, I don't know, the Inquirer or whatever it is. This is, this is real news. 3D printers in a gym, they're doing food. I guess they made a, I don't know, living tissue. Can 3D printing of living tissue speed up drug development? Is it coming, folks? It's coming. Do I need to know about it? Do you need to know about it? Do we need to factor it into your investment portfolios and programs? Knowledge that the world is changing? Yes. Do we need to invest in these areas? Who knows? That's not the important question. The important question is staying on top and getting in advance of the world that's ever changing, staying in front of it. Because then I go to see a report, all these are in the Wall Street Journal, because I knew you wouldn't believe me if I printed anything else. All these are in the Wall Street Journal, but one of the companies in 3D printing, before you get all hyped up thinking it's gonna be wonderful, maker of 3D printers to take a $100 million charge down and they're losing money hand over fist. So just because we see the world changing does not mean it's a good place to invest. But it's also not something to ignore. Drones. Drones are turning into flying billboards. I just saw an article also in the Wall Street Journal. Insurance companies have been approved to now begin using drones to inspect houses. So after hurricanes or before, inspect roofs, inspect this, they just got approved, I think it was this week. They're using drones, though, for more important purposes. You guys probably saw this one. To herd sheep. Now, see, we have to have our priorities right. right? But the reason I bring these up are it's, it's very important, I think, that we stay on top of things for your sake. Now, what I put out for your benefit is everything I can possibly think of to come up with to help you. And when I say constant communication, some of you get these already, but I have newsletters we put out, I have economic quarterly reports that we put out. Any of you who are not getting these, make sure you're signed up. Number one, in the back of the room, we need name, address, email, and phone. Why? Because I mail some of these and don't email. I email a lot of these and don't mail. But these are resources that are available to you. I don't want you to miss out on these are reports that have already gone out. 
I will continue putting reports out. I will continue doing everything I can to keep you abreast of as much as I am and keep you kind of in the loop so that you don't fall behind. And as you can see, I do constantly update myself. You could talk to me anywhere on the street or whatever at any time of the year, and you'll see that. 